Carte Blanche turns 20 this month and there's a lot to celebrate. But it's not all about partying. As we enter adulthood, the focus is on giving back. It's about making a difference. And tonight we're launching the start of a seven-week fundraising drive. We've coined the phrase, the making a difference campaign, because that's what carte blanche does. Carte blanche affects people's lives in a very positive way. We also tell stories about how things aren't always working very well. But I think it's time after 20 years to give back and actually to press pause on the critical button and to say, now's the time to actually make a difference and say, how can we help? We all know the dire conditions in a lot of our hospitals and desperate neediness in some welfare organisations. But this time around, we're not there to expose the problems, but to overcome them. With your help, we want to raise millions of rands. Children will be our focus. We chose children, and children are in great need in this country on a variety of levels. Making a difference is part of the carte blanche tradition. And it's usually been you, the viewer, who's been moved or inspired by our stories of people who've overcome tremendous obstacles with determination and a whole lot of dignity. You may remember Eugene. I thought that was wrong. I couldn't sleep. I was trying to sleep, and I couldn't. After being knocked down by a car at five years old, Eugene Murphy was left not only semi-paralyzed, but with a strange and rare disorder. He had no subconscious control of his breathing. This meant that while he was awake, he was fine. When asleep, he stopped breathing. I would be so nervous if I was being put into something like that, Eugene. And you, you're quite cool about it, hmm? Yes. <laughs> For 13 years, the Murphy family had been putting Eugene to sleep with this respirator. So old, it was literally held together with sticky tape. And instead of a medical poncho, they found ordinary garbage bags worked almost as well. Now, originally, this machine was inside the bedroom with Eugene and his parents. The only problem was that nobody could get any sleep. So Mr. Murphy decided to drill a hole through the wall so they could place the machine in the lounge. Within an hour of the story being broadcast, there were calls, there were offers of support, and uh, Eugene's ancient respirator was replaced with a brand spanking new machine whose silence was deafening. Along with a computer and software, another four respirators were also donated. And money enough to look after not only Eugene's future medical expenses, but pass on to other children who would now be able to leave the hospital. And best of all for this cricket-mad teenager, John T. Rhodes came to the party, donating money and... Genuine John T. signature. <laughs> Carte Blanche's stories are about human beings. They, they tell human narratives, natural narratives. And the audience has always responded to that. It's extraordinary. Whenever we've shown a story of someone in need, we've never ever asked for money, but people have come forward and found solutions. South Africans are incredibly generous. We met 17-year-old Chris Corlett in 2000, a courageous young leukemia sufferer. He desperately needed a bone marrow transplant to save his life. Two hadn't worked, he was going for a third. Some people probably think I'm out of my mind <laughs> going for three transplants, but, um, you know, it's, it's either that or a possible three weeks of living. Thousands responded to the first carte blanche program with letters, charity drives, money, and offers to be tested as bone marrow donors. His mother, Tina, who spearheaded the drive to find a matching donor for Chris, was overwhelmed by the response. It was absolutely amazing. Um, from that, a TV commercial developed. If you watch Carte Blanche on May 7, you will know that unless a bone marrow donor can be found very quickly, Chris Corlett will die of leukemia, and there is no such thing as a small donation. That brought in an overwhelming amount of money. I mean, they, our idea was to try and get the machine that they needed to test more donors. The price tag of 500,000 Rand was raised and the machine bought. But time was against Chris Corlett, who died in September 2000. His mother went on and started the Sunflower Fund in memory of Chris. The fund has, in seven years, grown South Africa's bone marrow database from 800 to over 63,000 people.
Ten-year-old Kaylee Mycroft's desire for a state-of-the-art motorized wheelchair was also the start of something big. She, her sister and three best friends got together and quite incredibly raised the needed 20,000 rand in just seven weeks. <laughs> with the money left over, they didn't stop there. The Kaylee campaign was formed with a mission to buy wheelchairs and provide help like physio for children with no resources. It was the dedicated team of Kaylee and her mother Zelda who were the driving force. And because of Kaylee, Paul, who was confined to a dark hut, might be able to walk. Sebasili, a 14-year-old boy in Crossroads, is mobile. Vanessa, who crawled on her knees, sits high. Uneti Fengi and 14 other children from the Ocean View Clinic are next on the list of the Kaylee campaign. The snowball gets bigger and bigger. Today, the Kaylee campaign, a formal non-profit organization, operates throughout South Africa, helping hundreds of disadvantaged children and their families. Who would have thought that uh, a cerebral palsy child with a dream of her own independence could inspire her friends, her school, her community, and pretty much the country to that extent? When Ashley Kaimovitz was killed by a drunken driver, she left behind a legacy truly remarkable for her 19 years. Infants and children are pulled into dark alleyways, raped, and some even killed. Three years previously, at 16 years old, with no experience and only passion, Ashley had made a documentary on a struggling family counselling centre in Kailisha that was trying to counter the high incidence of rape and abuse amongst their children. Deep in the heart of the Kailisha community is a woman whose bravery and strength has been challenging the struggles against child rape in the townships. It was a meeting with Nukawe Makanyi and the children at her centre that had profoundly affected Ashley. She told me about this little girl of three and a half that had been sitting in the corner and her daddy had raped her. And, and Ashley looked at me and she said, you know, Dad's your hero, Dad's your protector. How do they do this? And then she said, I'm going to create awareness. I'm going to make a movie. We must fight child rape. We must fight for our children. We must fight for the love of our children, Utando Labatwana. I think we learned really for the first time through her eyes and through what she was doing of a reality I suppose that we all know about but probably choose not to really take notice of. At the first screening, Ashley raised 4,000 Rand, but she wanted more. It was Nakawe's dream to build a centre open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a haven for abused and neglected children. To do this, the centre needed to raise over two million rand. Wherever she is, she will phone. How is the centre? How are you coping sometimes? What are you doing? I will come and visit. You know, she, she was everything for, for the centre. And then Ashley was no, no longer there. When Ashley died, she'd raised nearly 300,000. Her story inspired others to open their hearts and give even more. It was very bad to lose somebody like Ashley. I'm sorry. In her short lifetime, Ashley achieved an incredible amount. And after that story went to air, the dream of creating a safe haven for sexually abused children in Kailisha has become a reality. In fact, Ashley's story helped to raise over six million rand to build this family counseling center with a clinic, community hall, therapy rooms, virtually identical to what then seemed an impossible dream. For over 20 years, children and their rights have been a big part of our stories. We've witnessed cutting-edge surgery, like the separation of Daniela and Anika, the magical moment when the sisters first saw each other, shared with you the saga of a heart transplant, looked at the awful phenomena of children who have to be parents because of AIDS, and tracked the miraculous progress of Courtney Faye, the youngest ever victim of crime. And always, Carte Blanche viewers responded. The spontaneous generosity from Carte Blanche viewers is a welcome and uh, unexpected byproduct of the stories we tell. 
But fundraising foundations for hospitals, even if they have government funding, is becoming an essential reality around the world. In Australia, the Sydney Children's Hospital Foundation is one of the most effective. In the last 20 years, it has raised over 100 million Australian dollars for the Sydney Children's Hospital Randwick. Chief Executive of the Foundation, Adam Cech, runs the fundraising campaigns. Donations come to us um, in a variety of ways. It's generally through individuals, but also community groups, special events and corporate Australia. From a little old lady on the street who contributes through payroll giving to the biggest telecommunications company in this country. From a cafeteria to state-of-the-art medical equipment, the foundation has enabled the hospital to operate at the top level, without the restrictions it would have with only government funding. The Sydney Children's Hospital building, which currently houses some 160 beds, was established via the foundation, who at the time raised $10 million, in fact, to actually create and establish that building as it stands today. The New South Wales Department of Health provides us with the bread and butter to be able to look after patients and look after patients well. But the Sydney Children's Hospital Foundation plays an immense role in helping to provide the jam all the extras that are going in to make this hospital so fantastic. Specialist physician and assistant director of clinical operations at the hospital, Dr Johnny Tates, has seen both sides of the story. As a South African, he initially trained in Cape Town. I was simply astounded when I arrived at the City Children's Hospital in Renwick to see the level of equipment, expertise and resources available. So I think foundations across South Africa could learn much from the way we operate in Sydney, the way that the foundation galvanises community support and helps that to drive urgently needed equipment and resources for the hospital. So why not borrow a successful model from another country and implement it here? We have generous viewers, as we've established before. We have corporates that are very generous and socially aware. All we're doing is simply acting as facilitators to help those hospitals deliver. In the next seven weeks, carte blanche will profile the paediatric surgical units of five state hospitals where the right medical equipment can save a life. We'll focus on two child welfare organizations who are trying to deal with the onslaught of abandoned and orphaned children. We will see the conditions they work under, what they need most, and we will ask our viewers and companies to help. A lot of these uh, state hospitals must have uh, rules and regulations and red tape. So how did you go about working with them to establish their needs? Hospitals, by definition, are very bureaucratic um, organizations, really. But they're all populated with extraordinary people. And we've met some of the most remarkable human beings who are angels of mercy, really. These are people who are dedicated to saving lives and put themselves in second place in order to achieve that. There's been some degree of suspicion in the bureaucratic hierarchy of some of the hospitals, with a degree of justification given who we are and the fact that we normally enter those spaces um, looking for something that's wrong. Then here we are saying, okay, we know there are things that are wrong, but we can help make them right. Um, and some of them have been so suspicious of us that they've said, thank you very much, no thank you. We don't need your assistance, which I think is a grave pity, actually, because they're really the hospitals that need it most. The five hospitals which have come on board are Johannesburg Hospital, Chris Harney Barrack Wanath, Bloemfontein Academic, Pretoria Academic, and King Edward Hospital in KwaZulu Natal. And the two charities are Johannesburg Child Welfare and the Johannesburg Parent and Child Counseling Centre. 95% of the donations we receive are earmarked for a purpose within the hospital. That means a donor coming in who wants to make a donation can nominate for that money to go towards the purchase of a piece of equipment. It may be about improving amenities within one of the wards where they can be recognised for their contribution. And so there's a lot of transparency between raising of the funds from the community to actually purchasing and helping to purchase something within the hospital environment. And it's on this model that the carte blanche campaign is based, using a wish list. 
It's not about handing over cash to the hospitals. It's about identifying the most urgently needed equipment and then persuading the corporates and uh, possibly even the viewers to help fund it. What we intend to do is if major donors from the corporate world, our advertisers in particular, come forward and want to contribute to a hospital and give a major piece of life-saving equipment, we are going to reflect that in our editorial space. Now, it's not a case of just handing over cash. To keep things clean, we've decided what would be best is to highlight the needs, point out where they are, define wish lists from the hospitals and say to the corporates, this is what they need. You buy this equipment, we'll lead you to the appropriate suppliers which have been led in turn to us by the hospitals um, and make sure that you hand over goods rather than cash. Tell me about administration, about uh, checks and balances. We're going to keep going back. First of all, we'll make sure that everything gets delivered and we'll reflect the delivery and we'll reflect the first occasion on which the equipment is actually used. And then over the next year, we're going to go back to all these hospitals, unannounced most often, just to see that everything is okay. The Sydney Children's Hospital Foundation has affected the lives of hundreds of thousands of children throughout Australia. If we in South Africa in the next seven weeks can do a fraction of that, it would be carte blanche's ultimate birthday present. My dream is to reach 20 million, a million for every year we've been on air. I think that would be a meaningful contribution. If we can raise that and make a difference in the lives of children, that's what we aim to do. Thank you.